OCO, I'm Roy Hamilton from the Cherokee Nation. I'm a citizen. And today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Cherokee family history or genealogy. And to do that, I want to talk about two things in particular. One being what is a Cherokee citizen and then what is being Cherokee by blood uh, because there is a difference uh, in the two categories. We often hear, you know, that our ancestor was a full-blood Cherokee, a statement that's made by many people that are trying to investigate their family heritage. In reality, the Cherokee people had no concept of the idea of a blood quantum or a degree of blood. And I'll try to clarify some of the misconceptions that come along with being Cherokee uh, today. Prior to and even after European contact, the Cherokee people were a social, cultural society. Um, their everyday lives centered around their seven clans. So, for example, I'm bird clan, so everything I would do from the time I woke up, my going to water ceremony, or uh, my traditional life would be centered around my bird clan. Uh, bird clan being everybody that was of that clan, my family. And I inherit that clan from my mother because we are matrilineal people. Uh, to a Cherokee, a person who had a clan, who could fluently speak the language or pr practice our traditional life ways, was considered a Cherokee. The amount of blood had no influence on a person's identity. You were either Cherokee or you were not Cherokee. And that was the only two races that we recognized. Um, so if my mother's Cherokee, I'm Cherokee, the father's sort of obsolete. Um, because we don't take into consideration any inheritance from that individual uh, for race. This shows you a little bit about where our, uh, we were located uh, prior to the Trail of Tears, which was 1838 to 1839. The boundaries prior to European contact, the Cherokee Nation territory covered parts of an area which are now the states of South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama, and it made up about 81 million square miles. The Cherokee villages and towns were only located in a smaller area, which included what became the northwest corner of South Carolina, the southwest corner of North Carolina, the northern section of Georgia, the extreme northeast corner of Alabama, Bama, and the southeastern section of Tennessee. This shows you some of our overhill towns, middle towns, lower towns, and, and an inclusion of what were called Chickamauga towns. Now, state rights over the Cherokees, we'll talk about under state law, any Cherokee or Native American who remained in the East and did not remove on the Trail of Tears were considered a person of color. A person of color could not vote, nor could they own land. So part of the uh, option during the removal era was you could take a reserve, become a U.S. citizen, and give up your citizenship as a Cherokee, and you did not have to remove on the Trail of Tears. So some took that option, uh, but immediately found out that they were in this category of a person of color, so they lost their land. Uh, in that process, there was a white gentleman by the name of William Holland Thomas, and he stepped forward being a friend of the Cherokee and said, well, I have an idea and you will give me your land. Uh, together we will raise money and we will purchase more land. And at some point, uh, you know, you can continue to live there and nothing will change for your lives. Uh, later in his life, he began to become ill and he realized it and he approached the United States and said, uh, could I give this land to the Cherokee to develop uh, a reservation for them to live on? And it's Cherokee, North Carolina today, and it becomes known as the Koala Boundary. Uh, so a, a, a population will be developed there under the Eastern Band Cherokee Indians uh, as a federally recognized Cherokee tribe, which have a permeable reservation, meaning it's not much like the northern reservations. They're not so contained. Uh, the borders are very permeable, and people come and go. They have a different... Um, system of identifying their membership, and that's through a row called a Baker row, B-A-K-E-R. That row developed in 1929 will be the source they use for citizenship today in their, or, uh, in their tribe. Uh, also, they have some things uh, that are different from those in, in Oklahoma, and they have a blood quantum uh, requirement, and I believe it's 1 16th, and they've added in recent years another requirement, and that is you have to be born within the Koala boundary 
to be eligible for citizenship. So women who are have, having children and they want them to be members of their tribe will have to return to the Kuala Reservation to have the child. Since the beginning of contact, the United States federal government wanted to assimilate all Cherokee people into the mainstream of society and be like Americans. So they would give us things like pots and kettles and farming uh, implements and say, be like us, you know, do, do what we do. Uh, they did so, they knew they could lose uh, their identity as Cherokee, so a lot of Cherokee would resist such things. It was an unwritten law that any Cherokee who left the confines of the Cherokee Nation and was gone for more than six months relinquished their rights as Cherokee, and later it would be written into our Constitution as a law uh, as part of the Cherokee Nation. So if you left and didn't come back within six months, uh, and you were most likely in the United States. You were considered a citizen of the United States and no longer a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, there was an option, the council would set up to hear cases where people returned, and if you made a good plea and they agreed with you, they could readmit you as a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, there was the group who left, a warring group that you may have heard of, called the Chickamauga, and they would leave the Cherokee as early as uh, the 1790s and became part of the Boot Hill area uh, of people who lived in Missouri in 1794. They moved to that location while it was still French territory, trying to get away from the encroachment of the British who were moving into our territories. Uh, and as a result, though, they gave up their rights as citizens and would become known as the Chickamauga. They were living in an area of the Booth Hill there in Missouri when a violent uh, earthquake happened in 1811. And many of these Cherokee migrated into Spanish territory at that time into what today is the state of Texas. And around Tyler, Texas, uh, a lot of Cherokee would end up in a pan-Indian community. Keep in mind that these Cherokee were no longer in the United States, and that was really their purpose. They were trying to get away from They just kept moving to get away from it. There are a series of books called the Moravian Diaries that are coming out. Um, each year, they're up to volume five. If you would like to read about this era, uh, the Moravians, which were a German Czech religious uh, movement who came among the Cherokee to try to bring us their religion, but we allowed them to become because we wanted their ability to teach us English. Uh, so from them, we would learn to speak English, and in exchange, they would try to convert us to their religion. They weren't very successful at converting us, but uh, many of our people began to learn English from them, and that was a way uh, our elders and our leaders thought we could combat the movement of Western civilization among us. We thought if we can educate our children to understand them by learning their language, understanding why they do the things they do, maybe that's the way we can fight, uh, we can survive. So uh, it, was, it was a... It was a planned process to allow the church to come among us in the first place. Uh, after that, you know, the Baptists would come, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, and they would open schools, and from all of them we would acquire uh, an education in English and, and to understand their ways better. One place we moved to was Arkansas Territory, and this shows you a piece of the Arkansas map. Uh, that dotted line across there would be Missouri. And then this was a territory we would uh, move into as early as 1790. Again, we would move there in 1817 and 1819. Uh, significant numbers would move to, at the time of Trail of Tears, there was about 3,300 or so already living uh, in this area or had moved over into Indian territory. So uh, we came there, the Osage were there, and we, we drove them out of that area and took their land. In the Treaty of 1817, a small group of Cherokee relinquished rights to the territory that covered uh, Kentucky and western Tennessee, and they accepted this small piece of land in Arkansas that I'd shown you. These Cherokee were given a choice by the federal government. They could remove to the territory of Arkansas, or they could remain where they lived and accept a 640-acre land reserve. Some took that 640, uh, 640 acres, but remember I told you they considered them persons of color, so they decided they were. Uh, they couldn't own the land and they had no voting rights uh, or no rights at all. So uh, that's when Mr. Uh, William Holland Thomas steps in and aids the Cherokee people at that time. Some of these Cherokee also remained in Tennessee and to receive the land reserve, but that was the catch I to told you about, you know, and then the, 
these Cherokee began to lose those land reserves and the federal government didn't enforce the promises that they had made in the Treaty of 1817. Also in 1817, when they did this, they, they took a session of land and in exchange they gave us a piece of land. The piece of land they gave us was Indian Territory, um, northeastern Oklahoma. 1819, they'll enter into another treaty with us, basically the same. They take more of our land. Uh, in exchange, they give us the same piece of land again in Indian Territory that they had given us in 1817. Uh, and then uh, in 1835, there's the Treaty of New Echota. In that same treaty, they give us the, the land a third time uh, <laughs> in exchange for land they took away from us again. So, um, so for uh, three times in three treaties, they give us the same piece of land that we occupy today. Although it was a group of Cherokee in Arkansas territory with the remainder of the population were in northern Georgia and in those same areas that we had occupied for a very long time. And that was considered the Cherokee Nation. This shows uh, the Arkansas territory, number 37, shows in 46, that is our current Cherokee Nation jurisdictional area. And it's also the piece of land that they gave us three times, including the piece that goes out toward the panhandle of Oklahoma. And it slightly went into Kansas, and it went into Kansas as number 38. There was a strip that went up. Um, they would eventually take number 38 from us and the strip that you can barely see and give it to Kansas because Kansas wanted a state that had square edges. <laughs> so that was their excuse for taking that. They will finally take this piece of panhandle because they said we weren't utilizing it, which was not true. We were using it and we were actually leasing it to cattle ranchers as grazing land as they went from Texas to Kansas for the markets. So it was actually a huge income for us. We would uh, uh, rent it out to cattle associations but the government decided it wasn't utilized to the potential, or they didn't want us doing that and impeding the cattle industry, so they end up taking that from us too, and we end up with number 46, which, like I said, is our current jurisdictional area. You'll notice there's a little chunk out of us up there in the corner, the little white piece. There's about six to seven tribes pushed into that little, little hole there. Uh, I couldn't name all of them, I'm sorry, but... Uh, they move them there, and that's their current uh, locations. Then in 1828, there was a treaty, and the Cherokee Nation ceded the small area in Arkansas for a larger area of land in what would become known as Indian Territory. Uh, they had given it to us again. This was another attempt by the government to remove the entire Cherokee population, but it only succeeded in moving the smaller population in Arkansas over to Indian Territory in that map. Arkansas was going to become a state in 1836, so that's why they wanted us out. While all of these treaties were being made, the Cherokee were not considered citizens of the United States, but were still citizens of the Cherokee Nation. This treaty set the stage to remove the entire Cherokee population to the new Indian Territory, and with the election of Andrew Jackson in 1828, it was the beginning of the end of the Cherokee Nation in the east, and we would cede the final small piece of, uh, from our 81 million acres originally. Uh, this is just a shot of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And truthfully, the only thing the Indian Removal Act did was give the president the right to negotiate the removal. Uh, that's all it really did. But it was the beginning, of course, and more and more eastern states, specifically Georgia, clamored to have the Indian problem taken out by the government. The act was a death blow to the Cherokee Nation homelands. And although Chief Justice John Marshall of the United States Supreme Court Appell the Cherokee's claim to sovereignty, Andrew Jackson, now president, was reported to have stated he made the decision that he'll enforce it. He had said we were a domestic dependent nation, but we had full sovereignty as a nation, having entered into government to government relations first with Britain and then later with the United States as another government. And only governments enter into negotiations together. Individuals uh, do not enter into negotiations with the United States government. It's a government-to-government -government relationship that sets up a country as a sovereign nation. And so he called us the domestic dependent nation. And that's the first time we're referred to as such. So people were like, well, what is a domestic dependent nation? It's never been said, and nobody knows how to define it. So eventually they will define it, and it's, uh, 
it's something like uh, we can have everything as a, as a sovereign nation, but since we're dependent, it means we will not raise an army. We don't have a military service. So the dependent part comes the United States agrees to be our protectorate. And so, you know, we, although our citizens serve in the U.S. Army just like other people do, uh, the distinction means that we won't have an army or we'll never raise an army as a people or as a nation. Sometimes, too, people will compare us to today, just as an example, uh, to the Virgin Islands or to Puerto Rico or to Guam. They are sort of the same thing. They are domestic dependent nations. Ever since the first treaty with the Cherokee was made in 1721, the British in later years, the American government considered the Cherokee nation a sovereign nation, and it was helped upheld that way. The federal government considered themselves a guardian of the Cherokee people, so they would often call us their children uh, and refer to us in such terms. But the Cherokee Nation was and is a protectorate of the, of the United, uh, is under protection of the United States. Puerto Rico also protected of the U.S. Although it is an island in the ocean, it is not part of the United States, and the Cherokee Nation is somewhat the same. So today we say our term often heard is jurisdictional area because while it's still a part of Oklahoma, still a part of the United States, it's the area where we operate and have jurisdiction as a government. The Treaty of 1835 sets about the removal uh, process and the, an unwritten law for many decades, like I said, in 1827, with the first Cherokee Nation Constitution, they, it was finally put down in writing that any citizen of the Cherokee Nation who left the confines of the nation was gone more than six months had relinquished their rights as citizens and were now a citizen of whatever nation they had gone to. The small group of Cherokee in 1794 did just that, and the Cherokee who chose to live as a U.S. citizen or live outside the U.S. relinquished their rights as a Cherokee. The Treaty of 1835 foretold of the final removal of the Cherokee, which would become known as the Trail of Tears or the Trail where they cried. And by March of 1839, the entire populace that were considered citizens of the Cherokee Nation were now living in the new Indian Territory. So those who had stayed behind, those who didn't follow with the nation were no longer part of the nation. Uh, they had given up their rights as citizens for whatever the reason might be. Uh, and this is the little section that I'd shown you where we uh, operate as a jurisdictional government today. Any Cherokee who remained in the East were not uh, citizens anymore, like I had said. And most federal and state records, such as a birth record or a death record, marriage and census records, they would have no designation for Cherokee, Native American, or Indian as a race. Only until the U.S. Constitution, the cons consensus, uh, census of 1870 or 1880 was there the, a designation for an Indian under race. Most of these censuses do not list anyone as I for Indian, and 99% of the race is listed as W for white. There's the distinction of B for black and MU for mulatto or CH for Chinese in Western states. Those people who lived in other states outside the Cherokee Nation in Indian territory were listed as W for white on census records. Being Cherokee by blood to the United States especially, if a person did not live in the Cherokee Nation, it was just the same as being any nationality lumped into one, an American. Americans were generally considered citizens of the United States and not the Cherokee Nation. So, you know, if you lived anywhere, Arkansas, uh, Missouri, Texas, Colorado, you were a citizen of the United States and of that state. But um, those in Indian Territory were not citizens of the United States, and they were still citizens of the Cherokee Nation. Two distinctions, two different governments. Anyone could live in the Cherokee Nation and not necessarily be a citizen of the nation. Um, we had intermarried whites. So if you look at our census or our records, it'll be IW. We had AW, which was adopted whites, uh, meaning we adopted them and they would be allowed to vote, and they were considered citizens by our people at that time. Um, by the U.S. Census of 1900, 90% of the Cherokee Nation population was considered United States citizens and not Cherokee. So like Choctaw, Chickasaw, Muscogee Creek, we were overrun with so many people, non-Cherokee and whites, that there were you know, three times to four times sometimes by population, more people who were not Cherokee than there were uh, living there illegally 
but the United States uh, really had no way of enforcing keeping them out. That there was no like border control or nothing to to keep people from coming going as they pleased. Uh, we sometimes call those people intruders, and there's even a book called The Intruders, and it will talk about some of the families that live there and list them. So it's good for genealogists who are looking for people that they think may have been living in the Cherokee Nation but didn't really realize they were citizens. Or maybe they were told they were citizens, but they can't find them on any row. So it's a good idea to check the intruders list. Uh, we had 11 districts at that time, and this kind of breaks them down for you and shows you their names. Today, we don't have the same districts. We have 16, and they're just numbered 1 through 16. Records weren't kept until after the Civil War, and the only records that were made for the Cherokee Nation prior to the Civil War were documented, documented by the United States government. With the Treaty of 1817, the federal government commissioned a list of head of households of those per, a Cherokee who immigrated to Arkansas territory. A list was also made of those Cherokee who took a land reserve of 640 acres, referred to as the reservees. The government did not take uh, another census until 1835, and it's called the 1835 census or the Henderson Row. And when it made a count of Cherokee heads of households just prior to removal, and they, it was the army they sent in to do the census, and they were trying to figure out where were uh, adult Cherokee males living, and if they should resist the removal, they would be prepared to know where they were coming from and where their homes were and things like that. Uh, so it was a preparation to, to remove us from our homelands. These censuses are often referred to as rolls also. Another census was not taken until 1851 in the Cherokee Nation, and it's called the Drennan Roll of 1851. The same year a census was taken of those Cherokee who had remained in North Carolina called the Siler Row. And again, these censuses mainly listed only head of household. Uh, and the Drennan Roll isn't real helpful unless you know your Cherokee family fairly well because it doesn't dis give you the distinction of who is head of household. It might be the first person on the list, but it could be any of those people. And it doesn't tell you any relationship to, to the people on the list. You don't know. It doesn't say one is a wife, the spouse. It doesn't say these are the children. It doesn't say, you know, it might be a grandmother living with the family. So you don't know the relationship unless you've already discovered it some other way and can go backward. Uh, for me, I eventually did, but at, it, it took me going through later records in like the 1900s and then stepping back and I realized who the people are and then I look at the 1851 Drennan Row and I'm like, oh yeah, now I know who they are. Uh, the other thing about it is sometimes it's in Cherokee, the Cherokee names. So if they happen to keep that in the Cherokee name but you don't know your ancestor's Cherokee name, then you can't, you, you can't make the uh, correlation. It's done by districts that I showed you on that map. Uh, so there's 11 different groupings, and then the households are numbered, you know, 1 through 400 or 500 or whatever the number might be. So it does become helpful, but not till much later after you've delved into the genealogy a great deal. And like I said, records kept by the Cherokee Nation did not exist until after the Civil War. The Cherokee Nation government took its first population census in 1880, and it's very helpful. The document was actually a payment list for monies from the Cherokee Nation's lands in the outlet near the Panhandle. Uh, they finally decided that they should give us a payment for it, and from that they were to divide it up among the Cherokee citizens. It turned out to be very little. These payment rolls were made again in 1883 and 1886, 1890, in 1893, and then in 1896, another census was taken for the Cherokee Nation. At the same time, records such as marriage, will, and probate were being kept by the Cherokee Nation district courts. So out of those 11 districts, there was a court in each one, and there they kept the records of such things. This is a picture of the Dawes Commission that was sent in to begin the process of allotment to individual Cherokees and the goal being to do away with the Cherokee Nation and establish the state of Oklahoma. The passage of the Dawes Act in 1887 was yet another attempt by the federal government to try to assimilate Cherokee people into the mainstream of America. And throughout the years, the Cherokee people were dealt with as a group and not as individuals. The Cherokee held their land in common. 
There was no individual land ownership. The Cherokee had lived on the same few acres since their arrival in the Cherokee Nation there in Indian Territory. Um, my family arrived and they moved into the, right out of Arkansas into the first county that they go into is um, Adair County today. Uh, at that time, it was the Flint District. So they move into the Flint District, and I still live where they settled uh, at that time. They called it Awahila, and it meant where the eagles rest, but not the bird. There was a family named Eagle, so they named it after one of the, the women that came on the trail. Uh, her name in English was Go Back Eagle. So they named it Awahila, you know, out of respect for her. Um, today, the name has kind of morphed and changed as people have moved in and the, the community has changed. So it's called Wahela. Uh, they dropped off the Awa and it's just Wah Wahela or Wahila. Uh, people see it and they pronounce it that way, but the locals say Wahela. It's just kind of the way we do the word sometimes. Um, but we've, we've been there ever since then, and that's where my grandmother actually took her land allotment or was uh, managed to get her land allotment. The Cherokee people were dead, well, like I said, is in. Uh, in, in our communities, you, you didn't own the land. You owned the house you built there. You owned uh, the orchards you might have grown. You owned the barn you built, the corn crib, anything like that. And if you decided you didn't want to live there anymore, you could sell it, but what you're selling is not the land. You're selling the improvements, the house, the orchards. And you could only sell it to another Cherokee because it had to stay with, you know, with a citizen. So you could do that, but you never sold the land. The land always was retained by all the Cherokee people. And you just used the amount of land you needed. If I needed five acres, that's all I used. If my neighbor decided he wanted to you know, have a cattle, um, have a, a larger farm, a, lot, a big orchard, he might want 100 acres. Well, I didn't care. You know, it wasn't being used. It was OK to use it. So that's how land was used. But the Dawes Commission was established to enroll the Cherokee and give us uh, an individual land allotment. So the Cherokee government fought, but they lost, uh, saying we had the sovereign right not to enter into such agreements. But when the Dawes Act began to fail, the Curtis Act was passed by Congress in 1898. The Cherokee are now being forced to accept land allotments whether we like it or not, and they were also get, being given a blood quantum. So although in the 1835 Henderson Row, they would break us down into quarters, quadroons, halves, three quarters, or full bloods for the first time, um, we never really saw that and never recognized it. Suddenly, we're being uh, encountered with this thing called a blood quantum, and most Cherokee don't understand because, like I said, we're Cherokee or we're not, right? Uh, it didn't matter what that percentage was. And we often use our own chief as an example. John Ross was probably about one-eighth Cherokee, but he was never considered anything but a Cherokee because his mother was Cherokee. If my mom's Cherokee, I'm Cherokee. That's just the way it is. So the blood quantum idea was confusing. So looking at the blood quantums on the Dawes Row, uh, there's no rhyme or reason. So, uh, you know, like, for example, my grandma is on the Dawes Row as a full blood which, and my mother then marries a, a white gentleman, and so she's half. Uh, my, mom's, my grandma marries a white man, so mom is half. My mom marries a white man, so I'm a quarter. Uh, but if you go back to the Dawes Row, my grandmother, who is a full blood there, her father is listed on the Dawes Row as half. So she, gets, she comes from a full blood mother, they say, and a half blood uh, father, but she's full blood, that the math doesn't add up. Uh, and some of the siblings are different quantums. Uh, a sister is five-eighths, a, a brother is seven-eighths. Uh, so the quantums, you know, don't make sense to us today. Uh, they might be occasionally correct, but you just never know unless you really do your genealogy, then you can kind of figure it out. Uh, but it doesn't matter because you're a citizen of the Cherokee Nation because your ancestor was a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. It has nothing to do with the blood quantum. Um, so our citizenship card has no blood quantum on it, while the United States still tracks our blood quantum based on that original Dawes blood quantum. And they put it on something called a Certificate of Degree of Indian Blood, which is just a little card. We call it a white card. And it will uh, have your name, your tribe affiliation, Cherokee, and it will you know, have your blood quantum on there. Uh, while, like I said, the Cherokee Nation card 
a citizenship card will not have any kind of blood quantum on it at all. They do this DAWs row and it actually fails because when they announce that they're going to enroll Cherokee for a piece of land, the Cherokee Nation is overrun by non-citizens claiming they are citizens wanting this piece of land. The DAWs Commission realizes it right away and so they throw out everybody and everybody is denied and they start all over. Uh, they start all over and now it's called the Dawes final row. So from that, they will say, well, were you on the 1880 row that was done in the Cherokee Nation? Were you on the 1896 row? And if you could answer yes and they could place you, they'd look at that row, that census, and say, yeah, th there you are in district, you know, Flint district, number 340. Uh, they would note that and they would accept you uh, onto the Dawes row and you would receive your land allotment. All it was for, the number that was attached, the enrollment number, was for that land allotment. That's, uh, there's a census number also attached. That census number will be your household. So for my grandmother, she's with her father, uh, her stepmother, her siblings. And I, not everybody enrolled themselves. Some people resisted. Uh, they just didn't want to be part of it. They wanted to keep the nation like it was, and they just absolutely were going to refuse to enroll. So, for example, my family didn't enroll. Um, what happened was my great-grandfather's third cousin's husband enrolled my family. And I'm grateful that they did, even if they got the blood quantums wrong, because if he, they hadn't done that, I wouldn't be a citizen today. I wouldn't have a connection to the Cherokee Nation legally. So, uh, like I said, I'm glad they did. But there's one other thing they did in that process, and that is my grandmother... Um, Peggy Christie had a little sister named Lydia. Well, the third cousin apparently didn't know about her, so she's not enrolled on the Dolls Row. What does that mean? Well, the scenario could be if she never married another Cherokee, she would grow up, um, marry a white man, have children, they would be my cousins. They couldn't be citizens of the Cherokee Nation unless they chose that grandfather, my great grandfather, who is also on the row. But his blood quantum's different, right? So their blood quantum would be identified as less than me, although we're the same. Uh, the other scenario would be if her father hadn't have been on there and she had grown up and not married another citizen, none of her family could be citizens today. Uh, there was a man in about 1850s, up into the 1870s, who was very active in Cherokee government, and his name was Smith Christie, another relative of mine. And he was even acting chief occasionally during the Civil War era when John Ross was away in Philadelphia and in Washington. Um, he has no descendants on the Dawes Road because during that time he thought it best to send his children away to school to get them out of the Civil War, uh, what, what was happening there. Well, they did go away to school, but in the process they met non-citizens, fell in love, married them, and then their lives just went different directions. They never came back to the nation. So the, although those people are my cousins today and genealogically I can trace them and we're aware of each other and we actually communicate uh, and we go to family reunions together, they can't be citizens of the Cherokee Nation. How come? Because they don't have a direct ancestor on the doll's final row, which is the only source for establishing citizenship. It doesn't affect the fact that they are still biologically, racially Cherokee people and they can always claim that, you know, but it's, that's their right. Um, and we have the same ancestry. So. Um, when they were about to make the state of Oklahoma, the, Indi uh, the Cherokee Nation and other Indian nations there got together and they said, well, we have a good idea. We would like to develop an Indian state, and we'll call it the state of Sequoia. And what it actually did was divide Indian territory away from Oklahoma territory, and they said, well, Oklahoma territory will become the state of Oklahoma. Let us become the state of Sequoia. So they made up this map. They platted it. They put out counties. Uh, they wrote a constitution. They wrote, uh, um, uh, they, they developed the seal. They did all the things, you know, a state would do. Well, they were denied, of course. Um, and then the state of Oklahoma begins to develop, and they leave it all the same. They keep almost all the same counties, the same platting, and they take our seal, they take everything we did to develop the state of Sequoia, and they make the state of Oklahoma with very little uh, alterations. So we set it up for them, and they took it and did what they would with it. But as Oklahoma became a state, 
Most Cherokees became citizens of the United States. Some wouldn't become citizens till the 1920s, but most were adopted in as citizens of the United States at the same time. And we went into what uh, many Cherokee and a lot of government and historian people talk about as our dormant stage. Uh, we slept for a while. We thought that with the establishment of the state of Oklahoma that that did away totally with our government. And while that was the purpose, the United States did one thing and they kept a clause that said we continued in full force and effect, but they only did that because they needed us to sign papers that made it legal for them to do things. Uh, and in that process, it managed to keep us going through what we call the dark ages of the Cherokee Nation. In November of 1907, Oklahoma had become a state and the Cherokee Nation went dormant, like I had said, and, and it was that way for a long time. Um, actually, till about 1964, 65. This is a citizenship uh, certificate for one to become a citizen of the United States. Like I said, the Cherokee Nation today has no blood quantum requirement for citizenship. It's just that you have a direct ancestor who was a citizen about 1900. They do require that a person document themselves back to a direct ancestor. And so that's done through birth or death certificates or some, some type of documentation. And it connects me, for example, to my grandma who was on the Dawes row, the Dawes final row. The qualification for Dawes enrollment was that the individual was established as a citizen and that they were actually living in the Cherokee Nation. So it's a geographical thing. Um, if you lived in Arkansas, Texas, any other state, you were a citizen of the United States. Therefore, you're not a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. In the U.S. Census for the year 2000, there was about 750,000 people who said they were Cherokee. Only 265,000 of those people are actual documented citizens of the Cherokee Nation. So one could make the presumption that the difference is people who think they have Cherokee ancestry or know they have Cherokee ancestry but aren't eligible for citizenship. Today our citizenship is at about 300 and little, it's over 320,000 people. Um, and I'm not sure what the last census identified uh, the number of people who are claiming to be Cherokee, but from the 2000 census, we can tell there was a big difference uh, and that many people will claim to be Cherokee. So when people come to me and they want me to do their genealogy, it's really simple. You know, I have two questions. What's your goal? Do you want to be a citizen of the Cherokee Nation or do you want to document that you racially uh, are Cherokee by blood? And usually it's one or the other or both. And so from that, it's pretty easy for me to say, well, who was your uh, grandparent or great-grandparent that was living about 1900, and where did they live? If the answer is Arkansas, uh, Missouri, uh, Texas, California, my first response is, well, I would, I'm pretty sure you're not going to be able to be a citizen. But now I'll check, you know, make sure. But if they weren't living in Oklahoma about 1900, particularly 1896 to 1902, they're citizens of the United States, so I'm sure you're, you know, you're not going to be a citizen uh, today. That doesn't mean you're not Cherokee by blood because we can still do the tracing using the census every 10 years, using all the Cherokee documents, the censuses that were done, and look for your ancestor. I can usually find uh, anybody that was born from 1940 backward, just as long as you can have a name for me and hopefully a place they lived or a birthday or something that will give me some certainty that I'm on the right person. And like I said, it's easy to pretty much establish a citizenship or a non-citizenship. It's a little harder to trace Cherokee blood. And particularly if it's your sixth, seventh, eighth grand grandfather, grandmother, and they were living you know, in South Carolina, Georgia, any of those places I mentioned earlier that were part of the old Cherokee Nation, we call it, or our traditional homelands, it's harder to establish them as Cherokee. There is a group called First Families of the Cherokee Nation, and it's a heraldic society, but you have to be able to document through some kind of documentation where your ancestor lived back to 1835. And from that, they will accept you as your ancestor was a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, and that's through the Cherokee Heritage Center at CherokeeHeritage.org. It's a way for people to be recognized, like my cousins that I have mentioned, uh, Smith Christie's family, to ha have a certificate or something that acknowledges that their ancestor was Cherokee, but that, you know, and they can't be citizens today, but it's an acknowledgement and something they can be proud of. To contact me, you simply 
take my name and hyphenate it, roy-hamilton at cherokee.org. And if you think of questions later or if you would like to ask me questions, feel free to email me. Um, I went through my presentation uh, a little fast, and I, there's more I could have talked about, but I wanted to give you some basics and some things that could give you the ideas, you know, of what you might be looking for or where we were or what is a Cherokee citizen and then what is Cherokee by blood or people of ancestry. And if you have any questions, I absolutely feel free to ask. Well, if not, thank you. And if you'd like to talk to me in private, you're welcome to, too. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. Um, you're asking if my, what happened to my great-grandfather? Uh, no, he was around, and, but you connect yourself to the closest relative to you that was on the doll's final row. For me, that's my grandma. And so I take her, and she was on there uh, in 1902, and she was 12 years old, and she received a land allotment of 120 acres, which is where I live at today. I'm part of that. Uh, the, the father it makes no, uh, the man she married, my great grand, or my grandfather, it doesn't matter because he was white, so it doesn't affect my citizenship in any way. Uh, my grandmother and my mother married white men. So, it, you know, it, it, it affects my blood quantum, but it doesn't have anything to do with my citizenship. Uh, I do have a clan, uh, which is not uncommon, but it's not real common because you lose your clan if your mother is white or non-Cherokee. Uh, for me, the women might have married men who were non-citizens, but none of the, uh, I have a direct uh, matrilineal line just forever until I run into a Cherokee name that uh, I don't even know any more about her. You know, it's about 1790, and her name is O-N-I, O-N-I, and that's all I know. But my bird clan connects to her, and that's how I keep my clan going. Now, for example, if I have children, if I had boys, my boys would have to marry another Cherokee girl who had a clan to continue the clan. But if I have daughters, they will always carry the clan. Uh, for example, my sister had a daughter and a son. The daughter, when she marries and her children, they will be bird clan. When the boy marries, the clan will end if he doesn't marry another Cherokee with a clan. So, you know, it's easy to lose your clan. So it's understandable that a great majority of our people no longer know what their clan is. Plus, the unique thing about me is I'm still on that same land. So although I apparently look very, you know, I look white. You may not even think I was Cherokee if you met me on the street. But my situation is I grew up and I, we stayed where we were from the time of the trail. So I was brought up traditionally. Uh, I know, you know, I have a ceremonial ground. My family were always active in the ceremonial ground. Um, and all I ever knew was Cherokee. So identity is a whole other subject, you know, because I wake up, I'm Cherokee. I don't think of myself as white. And truthfully, I never even had the concept that I was white until I entered into the fourth grade. And some other children pointed out that I wasn't full blood <laughs> because the whole time I just thought I'm Cherokee and that's all I am, you know. But that's because I was brought up and reared in a community that was all my Cherokee family. Uh, I noticed the differences, but I just never put the idea together that you could be half or full or a quarter. I didn't know what blood quantum was until I was uh, immersed into a school where there were a lot of white children that pointed it out for me. And once they pointed it out for me, I got the idea that there was blood quantums. Uh, but I didn't know it made a difference until I was going to college. I mean, I didn't know that, uh, that the blood quantum might be important to somebody. It's not to me. It doesn't make any difference to me. I'm just Cherokee. So. But, you know, the correlation from that is I have a cousin that lives in Germany, and my cousin in Germany has never lived in the United States. Um, his father uh, was in the military and met a German lady that had a child. They didn't want to come here. They wanted to stay in Germany. So we talk on Facebook, and we email, and we call each other about once a year. But one day the idea of identity came up, and he's very proud to be Cherokee. Uh, and he thinks it's important, and he's a citizen. Uh, he's a citizen of Germany, the United States, and of the Cherokee Nation. But his identity, when he gets up, when he wakes up in the morning, as he put it, he's, he's German because his mother's German. Uh, he speaks German. Uh, that, that's his whole life. That's all he's ever known. So he knows this other race that's in him. Well, I know the other races that are in me. You know, I'm part of just about everything, it seems like, uh, French, uh, 
German a little bit, a lot of different things through my father and through the white people who married into my family. But since my only experience has been Cherokee, I wake up Cherokee, I go to bed Cherokee, I think Cherokee ways, you know. Um, I miss my home when I'm out here. I'm not used to cement. So where I'm from, it's very different than here. Uh, and I appreciate all of the things I see and do, but my identity is to, to where I'm at at home. It's connected to the land. It's connected to the people. Uh, and I have a lot of relatives, you know. Uh, I couldn't begin to count them, and that's because I have a clan. Anybody that's of my clan is my brother or sister, my nephew, my niece, my aunt, or my uncle. So, you know, I have thousands of relatives, uh, which is a little bit different in a, a, the Western concept of cousins and things like that. You're only related to people you're biologically related to. Well, I'm related to people who have a clanship connection to me as well as biological connections. So it gets very confusing for people at home sometimes that come visit and I'll introduce young people, this is my nephew. Uh, and so they say, well, which parent is your brother or sister? And I'm like, well, neither one of them. We're not biologically related at all, but he calls me uncle and I consider him my nephew because you know that's just the way we are as our clan system operates. So for some people, and for genealogists, it gets very difficult. Uh, a young man came to do his certification work among us Cherokees, and he chose my family to do his work on. And he would come to me and he would say, I'm just so terribly confused because everybody keeps introducing people as aunts and uncles and nephews and brothers and sisters. And then I try to figure out, you know, how to put it down and they're not really related at all. There's no biological connection. So, you know, I had to explain the clan system and help him figure out who is actually biologically related where he could do his certification work uh, with my family. And plus, uh, with Cherokees and, I, it, not a lot, but many of my cousins, they're not married to the father, and they could care less who the father is, so they never talk about it. So some of them, he would want to know for you know genealogical reasons. He would go, well, who's the father? And they would say, they just don't talk about that. You know, it's, it's, it's insignificant. It doesn't matter. The mother's all that matters. We always know who our mother is, but there's the possibility you may not know who your father is. So, and it's not just a Cherokee thing, I'm sure. But uh, he ran into it a great deal, and I think it confused him so much that sometimes he was just ready to throw up his hands and give up. But he managed to get his certification. He became the first certified uh, genealogist uh, who specialized in Native American genealogy at the time. So it was kind of a, an experience for him, I think. Do you have any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, do Cherokee keep records of the enslaved Africans? What we, what we usually refer to are the Freedmen Row, and in the, the Dawes did an extra row, and it's called the Freedmen Row. Now, there's not a lot of rhyme or reason to that either, because, and by that I mean, for example, there's one family where there's two sisters, and they both go before the Dawes Commission. One sister is enrolled on the Dawes final row. The other sister is enrolled on the, Freedman, the Dawes Freedmen Row. They had the same parents, you know, tri uh, they should have both been on the doll's final row the way it should have been. But we don't know the answer to why it's that way, but people speculate for different reasons, say, well, one sister was darker than the other, and they decided that she was, should be on the Freedman row. Um, and sometimes I don't think they even ask. They just made that decision for themselves, the person doing the, the, the doll's row or the Freedman row. And we also know that people on the Freedman row often are Cherokee by blood, some connection. Now, some are the descendants of uh, the former slaves of the Cherokee, uh, so, and they may not have a biological blood relationship, but many of them will have, have the biological relationship. And the distinction comes about primarily from the 1866 treaty, which you can Google and find it, and you can read about it. And that's when we accepted uh, our freedmen as full citizens of the Cherokee Nation, according to that treaty. And that's a case you may be thinking, you may know about it. There's a case in uh, the court right now, and I think this April they're supposed to make a decision on it. It's been going on since, I think, about 2006. Courts move slow. Pardon? I don't. I, uh, I can't remember. But if you Google Cherokee and Friedman, it will definitely come up in your Google uh, search. And I don't comment a lot on it because I don't really, I'm not a lawyer, 
Uh, of course, everybody has an opinion on it, but you can read the treaty for yourself and see what you think it says, you know, anyone can. But apparently lawyers have the ability to, you know, three of them can read the treaty and three of them have different opinions, whereas I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> but uh, we'll find out pretty soon what the courts decide. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? What do I do? <laughs> uh, my title is uh, Special Projects Officer, which means I just do anything. But primarily, I try to work around family history projects. Uh, right now, we would like to develop a database that's Cherokee specific, which houses all the families of Cherokee people. You know, and anybody that thinks they might be, they could go in and search, connect to that family and see where they were and all the data we could have on it. Not just genealogy, but family history, like uh, oral family histories, uh, photographs, add things like that. We also hope by the end of May to have Cherokee History Online where an individual anywhere in the world can go onto our website and take an about 11 chapter course and learn about our history. So that's the two things I'm kind of working on now. Can someone be a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and a citizen of another tribal nation? It's possible. Cherokee Nation does not have a law that says you can't. But as far as I know, every other tribe does. So they don't. So, you know, it, it depends on the other nation. Cherokee Nation doesn't. But if the other nation does, then obviously you couldn't. Uh, for example, I know Choctaw and I know Muscogee Creek and I... And then, and then there's some exceptions with the United Katua Band. If you're on their base row as a descendant, I think they will allow you to be a, uh, a member of their band. But if you're not, uh, you have to have a quarter blood Cherokee and be on the Dawes final row. But you can't also be a Cherokee Nation citizen. You have to choose one or the other. And probably the reasoning there, and you know, it's kind of an assumption on my part, uh, government services, you don't want somebody going to both governments asking for the same service or so it's a kind of a way to keep track of what government is providing governmental services to what individual maybe but I know some that are uh, Cherokee and UKB and but that's all I know I don't know of any that are Cherokee in another tribe I do know on the Dawes Road there is a gentleman and I wish I could remember his name but he enrolls on the Dawes Road and he's also enrolled with the Osage which that's the only one I've ever seen, though, during Dawes era. I found it really fascinating. And both knew about it, and they let it happen, which I didn't think they were supposed to. But I also know that during the Dawes era, when they're enrolling, it didn't matter if you were Muscogee Creek, if you were Choctaw or Osage or uh, even white. If you lived in the Cherokee Nation and were considered a citizen, you were on the Dawes row as a Cherokee, which includes some Shawnee and Delaware also. Now, later on, the Shawnee and the Del Delaware will ask to separate and become their own governments. And it, it's a process that occurred. They are now separate governments. Uh, but not every Delaware or Shawnee has to go to be a citizen. They have the option. They can stay with the Cherokee or they can join the Shawnee or the Delaware tribe. And under that process, we developed something called a Memorandum of Agreement or Memorandum of Understanding so they can occupy some of our jurisdictional area without actually owning land. Uh, so they have a piece of land around Bartlesville for the Delaware, and that's where their government's set up. But under the agreement, they don't, if they can't, uh, I believe it is, they can't have trust land unless we agree to it. Uh, like all tribes, we guard our, our, our territory uh, somewhat vigorously, I think. And actually, by constitution, we are required to. So our chief has no option and our council has no option unless they want to face impeachment that they object to any other government, which sometimes they term as a foreign government, uh, trying to operate within our jurisdictional area. It's something we usually oppose unless we enter into agreements of some kind. Anything else?
You mean like government to government type relationships? Um, I only I know of a few that are recognized, uh, state recognized tribes, and do they have any relationship with Cherokee Nation? Uh, not really. We don't believe that states have the rights to recognize tribes. Only the United States has the right to recognize tribes, uh, is the general opinion. Uh, and that's because of the way the United States is set up, saying they are the only ones through the Department of Commerce at one time, now the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of the Interior, that have the right to negotiate with Indian tribes. So if that's true, then we say they're the only ones who can recognize and become you know, federally recognized, and we think states do not have that right. So we, we occasionally will lobby against those, such things happening, and that has happened in Tennessee, for sure. You know, one time, I think they had four to five recognized groups. Um, our lobbying efforts uh, succeeded, and there's no longer any recognized Cherokee groups in Tennessee. Uh, I think it's something else that's attached to our Constitution, though. It's what we uh, agree in our Constitution to, to, you know, if you're not Cherokee Nation, then you're not Cherokee uh, affiliated or Eastern Band Cherokee Indian or United Ketua Band. We think that's the only three recognizable uh, tribes that should have government to government relations with the United States. Me personally, it doesn't bother me. I, I think they should have good reason. I think they should have a good documentation, and that's the one thing that bothers me the most. A lot of them charge for a membership, and I think maybe they are, I think sometimes they're fraudulent and they actually take money from people without giving anything in return or with the ability to give anything in return. So I hate to see individuals hurt by these groups. And they do pop up a lot. Uh, you know, I, everyone's an individual case, but I just don't want to see somebody um, treated wrong. And I've had individuals come to me with cards, you know, saying this is the card I got from a blank and blank group in this state. What does it entitle me to? And I'm like, well, nothing. It's not, you know, there's no services attached to that from the Cherokee Nation. We don't recognize them. So, 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 so sometimes, you know, they're charging $50, $100 for that card. Well, that shouldn't be the case. A uh, card should never cost you. If it's legitimate, it should be a free card. Identity card. They could be. You could. I can never tell anybody what their ancestry is. You know, it would be wrong of me to tell you you're not whatever you say you are. It's just I, I don't have that right or that ability. Um, that that's your right to always say my ancestry is. You know, and I can say my ancestry is Scottish, and that's true, but I, I can't say I'm a citizen of Scotland because I'm not. You know, that that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Good. Good. <laughs> Well, thank you. I appreciate your attention. It's been wonderful. And if you ever think of questions, feel free to email me.